We approach the final curtain, as somebody once said. Um, and if I may be allowed, everyone else this week has been dwelling on their childhood and the impressions of childhood. I just want to mention one thing from my childhood, which is relevant when I see this group, and that is, so I grew up in the late 1950s and early 60s in Birmingham, not very far from where Kit was growing up. And um, we had a poor family, and we didn't have a television until we managed to persuade our rather poor parents that they needed a television. So we had a television in the early 60s, little black and white television, and my absolute favorite program was Batman. <laughs> Batman, in which every Saturday, Batman and Robin would encounter and fight one week the, the Riddler, one week the Penguin, one week the Joker, uh, one week Catwoman. And then something very special happened in 1964. They made an all Technicolor feature film of Batman. And the greatest thing about this film, which I went to see at the Aston Villa Picture Hall on a Saturday morning, uh, was that uh, all four of those villains came together. So evil were they. They were going to take over the United Nations. Batman had to stop them. So evil were they that they grouped together and we saw all, we saw, we saw Catwoman and the Riddler and the Joker and the Penguin all in one space together. It was the biggest thrill of my life. And that's what I'm feeling today. <laughs> because this week over the last two days we have had the most wonderful sessions with each of these wonderful people one by one. And now we've got this, if I can use the obvious uh, cliche, class act. <laughs> together. They're all here. Now, I'm not going to assign roles of Penguin, Catwoman or anything, but obviously Herr Holloway-Smith must be Bruce Wayne. <laughs> so thank you. And I ask you to, uh, I think again the cliche is, put your hands together for a final time. <laughs> So hi everybody, thanks for coming um, to this session, which is really exciting because here we are all together um, <clears throat> and it's about class and about what we understand class to mean and how it relates to our personal lives and how it relates to literature. Um, and so the format is going to be such that each person is going to talk about what class means to them and then we'll have a wider discussion between us, picking up on various things and then we'd like you to get involved, um, so that it's not just us talking to you, but you also participating. Um, so as we're, as we're having this conversation, you know, it'd be very interesting for us to hear about your own experiences of class. Um, I think because we're in Germany, it'd be very interesting to hear um, German perspectives as well. Um, try to keep your contributions short-ish. Um, if you go on a bit too long, I might have to stop you. <laughs> but, but, but we do want you to participate fully, okay? Um, so that's the format, and I think we should start with Delgit. Hello? Is, that Is the mic on? <laughs> Hello? Yes, that's fine, thank you. Tell, tell um, them about the sandwich, Delgit. <laughs> Come and see me afterwards if you want to know about the umami of sandwiches I experienced <laughs> yesterday afternoon. But that's a different story. I did a talk uh, a few years ago at uh, one of the colleges in Oxford University, uh, you know, reading and talked about my work. And then somebody put their hand up and said, you mentioned um, class, working class. Uh, I might mention it a few times, I don't know, or once, whatever. And he, and he said, but there's no such thing as class. Right? And so my response is the usual one, that if, if you don't think there's any class, it's because you're probably middle class. And you don't experience the downturn of being from a certain class, the, the, the difficulties. Um, in, in my sort of general life, I sort of reflect on this after these amazing conversations yesterday, I, I would say all my friends are from a kind of working class background. I don't quite know how that happened. I guess we went from, I've got one or two friends from school still, and then some from university, and you kind of gravitate to people of your own sort of background. And so in a sense, whilst I am a professor at university and... Uh, I, so in that sense, I have a kind of very middle-class life. 
also there's the other elements, and, and Kit was talking about this yesterday as well, you know, there's sort of things you can't leave behind. Um, so I've still got more, you know, things like, even financially I would say class changes things. I have to work full time to pay my mortgage off. And I've been working more or less nonstop for several decades and full time. Uh, to, you know, I should, I, should, I should probably just move out of London, but if I want to live in London <laughs> as a working class person, it's hard. You know, you don't have any support from your parents. Mm -hmm. So that sort of stuff's difficult. And that affects the way, like for me, it's hard to write because I've still got this fat mortgage. Um, you know, so I don't get the free time. And I, and I think it's also one of the other things I noticed in, in, in the literature world is it's, it almost seems to be rude to ask somebody what their job is. I found, I don't know if you found this, and I've done it once, a few times in the past when I first got into the literature world, in the poetry world. And people sometimes just go quiet or say, oh, yeah, I edit a magazine, uh, these three issues a year, uh, and that'd be it. And they go, wow, how do people manage that? You know, how do they, how do they you know, pay rent? Uh, how do they just, how are they just an editor of one magazine? That's all they do. Or, you know, those sort of things. So it's, I think that's a kind of almost an unspoken thing. Um, so I, I think there's no such thing as you become one class or the other for if you're working class, but I think I'd probably oscillate between the two in various forms. Great, Here thank I you. Am. Joelle. Yeah, um, uh, so I'm working class because I come from a coal mining family. I come from very traditional, who was we talk, I was talking to kids about it, literally cloth hat and whip it. I come from that background and it's a background that is economically deprived but we call it decent working class, which is in itself quite offensive. But it means, do you know, because there's a sense of, um, it's coming from a kind of Protestant work ethic mixed with a Catholic need to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good. You go to work and you sweat and you get dirty and you come home and you wash and you drink and you go to bed and you get up at 5 a.m. the next morning and this is life. Um, so this is my heritage, and this is, means it's affected every aspect of my life, how I think, the opportunities I can take up. So I went to university as well. For me, it was a huge thing, and the first time I was really, really aware of class was at university, when it wasn't a huge thing for people there. Like, I literally had someone playing cornet when I went off. It was like a little band played. It was a huge deal that I... Someone got away, someone went to uni. But when I got to university, I'm not from a family with any money, so nobody could pay for me to be there. I did a full-time theatre degree, meaning I was doing lectures, seminars from 9 a.m. till you know, 5 p.m. and then from six till nine doing rehearsals. So I couldn't get a job, and so I lost my home. And um, so what it class means to me is that necessity is the mother of invention. So I created theatre shows that had a bed in them, yeah? And for my whole final year, I slept in the rehearsal studios. I'd rehearse all day <laughs> and then be like, okay, I'm just gonna do some, <laughs> you know? Um, it gave me that, but it also meant I was demeaned and it made me extremely vulnerable. It made me very sexually vulnerable because I'd need to go and hang around um, with people who had money so that they could eat. It means that people will buy you a drink all the time, but nobody thinks to buy you any food. And as Kit was saying, part of it is being really hungry. When I left home, I wasn't working class anymore. Even though I was at university, I was underclass because I lost everything. And then, of course, the university wanted me to leave because it's embarrassing having someone homeless study. It is. But um, I, you know, I didn't leave and I finished. So it means that. It means that even now, I've, I've been to Buckingham Palace, I've performed for all kinds of people but you were always, I wear a suit because I feel dirty. You know, part of it is I need to be smart because we feel like you're not really allowed in this space. It means vocabulary. Do you know what it means? It means only accessing certain words through books and never hearing them said. So you're being interviewed and you say words wrong all the time or in the wrong context. So it affects you in that kind of way. But it also means, um, it means I'm part of the greater part of humanity. And, you know, I'm very proud to be from that. I can't ever stop being working class, even though I'm, I'm a writer. I recently had my photograph taken for a big exhibition, and they wanted to photograph working class butchers, and everybody got photographed in a space they worked. They took me to a council estate and had me stand in front of it, and I kept saying, I'm, I'm actually a writer. Um, could we, I could do a library. 
I have some books. Okay, I'll do it on stage. But they wouldn't do it. I had to be. In the end, they put me in a bar. And if you see the photograph, which I'll put on Instagram, I am giving the photographer the filthiest look in the world. Because I'm like, oh, here I am being stereotyped again. You little fucker. Oh, you bad people. <laughs> um, so that's part of what it means to me. Great, great. Um, Kit? Um, <coughs> for, uh, for me, I think it really came home to me what it meant to be working class when I set up the scholarship for a working class person. Marginalised person is what I called it because it, I wanted to include other people. When I set up the scholarship and I thought to myself, right, I will just put up the money for the fees uh, to do the course. And then I thought, and I thought about the experience of many of my friends. I went to university when I was 51, but I do remember my friends going to university when, uh, when they were young. And I thought, okay, you, it's no good to just go. You've got to participate. If you participate at university, um, and in many social spaces, you need money because a lot of the conversations at university will happen. Should we go and get a cup of coffee and a drink? Should we go and get a sandwich? If you're working class, you haven't got the money for a cup of coffee and a sandwich. So you go, do you know what? I'm not hungry. I think I'll go. And that really interesting conversation that's going to help you with your studies is going to happen then when you can't afford to go. So um, I also added the money for a sandwich and a cup of coffee uh, if you go to university, uh, if you got the, um, the bursary. Then I thought, oh, my God, laptop. And then I had a wealthy friend, and I said, do you want to put up the money for a laptop? So she put up the money for a laptop. Then I was like, reading list. And the staff at Birmingham Waterstones, that's the staff, not Mr. Waterstones, paid for the reading list for, this, for that. And so I've got the reading list, I've got the money. And then I was like, oh, my God, only people in London can get this because Birkbeck's in London. So then I got someone else to put up the travel bursary. So in the end, I thought, oh God, you know, I've covered everything. I've covered every base. And then the guy that got the bursary, who happened to be a boxer, who was writing poetry, and he was so embarrassed about writing poetry, he hid it in his boxing gloves, because no one ever puts their hands in someone else's boxing gloves. And he was writing these bits of poetry and hiding it in his boxing gloves. And he, dis discovered, he decided to come out I'm going to come out as a poet and not as a boxer. And he got the bursary. He was fantastic. And in the end, we managed to get two full-time bursaries and five other things for people. But what was really interesting is me, from an underclass, as, as Joelle said, I wasn't working class growing up, believe me. I, was, I had working class people I thought were posh. I was way under. And even me, I couldn't... I couldn't just think about the reality of being working class at university because I'd never been. And I had to do a lot of work to actually think about the day-to-day -day things that go on for people. And then Stephen, who got the bursary, said to me, oh, wow, that's great. What do I wear? And I thought, I didn't fucking think of clothes, did I? Because it was a big deal. He would have felt embarrassed getting on the train to London in what he wore, even though it doesn't matter. But to him, it mattered. He wanted to have university clothes. Uh, which I didn't buy for him, by the way. But it was really interesting that I hadn't gone there. Mm. So sometimes even the solidarity of being working class and the desire to help working class, you still overlook something. We still don't know everybody's story when it comes to working class. And I think for me, doing Common People was that celebration of all the different ways that we are working class, all the similarities, the rights and the rituals that we have in common. But also the enormous differences, for example, between someone that lives in the city and someone that lives in a tied cottage in a rural community. Big differences there. Um, but overall, it was such a privilege to be part of somebody else's... When I did the scholarship at first, um, I wanted to call it the Fat Chance Scholarship because I'd say to people, why don't you do an MA? And they'd go, Fat Chance. So I wanted to call it the Fat Chance to give somebody that Fat Chance. And to, it was so great to be part of someone else's journey on that. The university have taken over a lot of the finance of the scholarship now. So it's in its fifth year, I think, and it's going strong. Um, but it's, it's such a great thing to celebrate being working class and not apologise. 
don't apologise from who we are, but to celebrate who we are. And it, that kind of thing, us helping one another, I think is the way we demonstrate how great it is to be working class. Thank you, Thank you Wayne. <clears throat> Um, so I was thinking about, like, just off the back of what Kit said, in terms of um, the certain spaces you feel comfortable in. And well, everyone said it really. Like, um, that got it to go last, by the way, because that everyone's already said all the interesting stuff. But for me, like, the idea of this kind of there's, I mean, everyone in here is clever and already knows, but those different types of capital. So it doesn't only. It isn't only contingent upon um, how much money you earn or whatever, but all of the, the social and cultural capital that kind of comes along with it. So like when Joelle was saying, uh, you know, I get interviewed and I say words wrong. And like you can feel like you, there's that's a, and I felt the same like when you, you get you get invited to these places and I get invited to loads of places now because um, I'm the editor of Poetry Review and uh, but I still feel like everyone's just waiting to catch you out, do you know what I mean? So like the, the idea, and also it's not just about like poetry, right? It's about like all kind of, all of the cultural capital surrounding all art forms. So the idea that I might not get a reference that someone said, or if someone's talking about a painting, I don't know what the fuck that painting is, do you know what I mean? And then, and then, and then I'm kind of like the one being caught out. And, um, it was a really interesting thing when I, when I was doing, like, this... I spoke a lot yesterday, didn't I? Like, a lot. Um, but I, and it was helpful to have, like, Mateus to sort of bounce off. But when we were talking about um, that idea of, a, like, a socio-symbolic value system, right? The idea that, like, a middle-class lens through, um, you know, throughout the years they produced... Um, the means to qualify their own existence. And part of that is, you know, the Protestant work ethic or whatever. And part of it is um, a sense of knowledge and, and a deservingness to be in a certain space. And, like, and, and when people are, are brought up in those environments, they don't ever need to learn any of that stuff because it's already talked about. But when, we, when we're in those environments, like, we don't know what the hell's going on. Because, like, if it, you know, I, I knew a lot about EastEnders and Coronation Street and all of those programs, like, back in the day. But we didn't know any of this other stuff. And then, and then um, we were talking yesterday about this kind of, like, the way that value, a higher and lower value, is kind of arbitrarily apportioned to different social practices, jobs, people groups, etc. So we was, I was saying, like, you know, when I go back home now and everyone's like, God, you're like a poet and you've got a PhD. And my mum, by the way, doesn't know what a PhD is. So I had to explain to her, like, when I passed my Viva, scraped through the Viva, and she, and she was like, so what does that mean now then? And I was like, um, well, I've got doctor in front of my name. She said, what, the doctor? She didn't really understand what it was or how, because I'm not, like, saving people's lives. I mean, I am, actually, <laughs> but, like, but in a much kind of... Um, yeah, like, because of the, that was the only kind of form of, like, doctor that, 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 that she understood. And I think, like, um, the reason why I said yesterday it's important for, uh, for us lot, I guess, to, re to retain the, the, uh, a connection to or the idea of being working class is because, um, because these, you know these kind of positions are seen as more valuable or more interesting or like more culturally sort of, uh, I know, they, 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 they kind of just seem higher, don't they? And like the idea that when you occupy these positions, like you become middle class. So, you know, Joelle's won the T.S. Eliot Prize and she's middle class now because uh, you get paid to talk about yourself and go all over the world and doing that. This is middle class thing, right? It's like, because it has to be, right? Because a working class person can't have access to that. So that's what, that, when I finished my PhD, sorry, I'm going like all over the shop. I literally didn't know how to do this bit. Um, but like, I remember being at this guy's house for dinner, this like, other poet, and I just got, um, I was talking about class, and I just finished my PhD. And um, his wife turned around and was like, well, you're middle class now, aren't you? Because you've got a PhD. And there's a bit of me just like, 
go fuck yourself, you know? Like, what, so because I was working class and now I've got a PhD and that's seen as have it, being good or having some kind of higher value, all of a sudden I have to be middle class because a working class person can't occupy that space, do you know? And that kind of is what, that's kind of the, the tension that, in the space that I'm occupying the whole time. You're holding, like, the, it's a very real thing in that, like, you know, I get paid to just mainly talk about poems or write poems or edit other people's poems. And that is not, like, typically, there's no, there's no suffering. I mean, there is some suffering when you read those bad poems. But, like, ultimately, there's not, it's not on the same level as the stuff that you guys have been talking about and the stuff that our parents went through and the, you know, and the stuff that Joelle went through at uni or that uh, these lot, they're getting scholarships they're going through, you know? Um, but it's important for us to be visible in these spaces and to maintain a kind of sense of uh, where we were from so that other people can kind of access that space in the future. And we're challenging that as well, you know? That's, that's that, it. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, so it's really interesting because class is on a spectrum, right? Um, and we've heard different, different people with different backgrounds. I'll just talk briefly about my background because I know a lot of people don't see me as working class. And they hear the way I speak, the way I lead my life and so on. But actually, in my childhood, we felt working class. And we were also immigrant class, Right, so we talk, we, we talk about class and the intersections with other areas of our lives, whether it's sexuality, whether it's gender, and so on. Um, masculinity, actually. So, so you know, I, I read um, on the first evening about my, a little bit about my background and the house I grew up in. And my mother came from a working class family, so her mother was a dressmaker and her father was a milkman. And that working class family was part Irish and originally part German. And um, so it was also immigrant. And my, but my grandmother saw herself as what was called genteel, right? So the, the whole aspirational thing about, well, we, we come from a really poor working class background, but we're aspiring to move out of that. Because what did that mean when my grandmother was born in 1905? What, is it, what did it mean to be working class in 1905, before the National Health Service? You know, um, it was difficult. And I, I used to think my grandmother was a snob. But eventually, I came to understand that why wouldn't she want to move beyond her class? Because of all the struggle that entailed, it wasn't at the turn of the century. I don't think people had an identity that, that being working class was something amazing. And that, that was what you 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 clung on to, people aspired to improve their lives, to improve the length of their life, the food that they ate, the income that they were able to bring into the household, the prospects for their children. So my grandmother came from that kind of background and my mother was a primary school teacher. So when I say she was a school teacher, she eventually became a secondary school teacher. People say, well, you weren't middle class, you weren't working class. No, 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 because she was a teacher. And that's a professional job. Um, but, so, through my mother's job then, if she's, not no, if she's no longer working class, what is she? If the job doesn't define the class in some way, then what is she? Because we're talking about how it's where you come from, not what you do. Um, and is class about where you come from, or is it about what you do today? That's why I say I'm middle class, right? Anybody looking at me, hearing me, looking at my life, they would think of me as middle class. My father was immigrant class, and he came from a single mother, because his father died before he was born in Nigeria, who I discovered many years um, after my childhood, when I eventually went to Nigeria, that when she signed um, a form that I was given, it was a thumbprint. And he never told me this, but she was illiterate. But he would never have said that, right? Because he would have been ashamed. So she was an illiterate, petty trader. What that would have meant in Nigeria in the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s would have been somebody selling food in the market or on the street. So he actually came from a very poor Nigerian immigrant, uh, a Nigerian family, which during the, you know, the days of the empire, which was when he was growing up, would have been something to be ashamed of. He worked in a factory. So he was a welder in a factory, but he also became a political animal. So he was also a socialist and, and, and you know, very much involved in local politics. Did that make him middle class then? Because he got involved in local politics, but he worked in a factory. And then they had eight kids, so we had no money, right? And my mother 
stayed at home probably for the first 15 years of their marriage because she had to look after the children. And uh, so there was poverty in our household. But at the same time, the school next door, the Catholic school next door was a convent. And it was literally, the house I grew up in had once been part of the school. It was literally next door. And it was, I don't know what they called it, it wasn't quite a private school, but it cost 10 pounds a year to be studied, to be educated there. Which my parents, my father then negotiated, because he's a Nigerian, and he got some kind of discount, because there were so many of us there. But that is not the same, this is why I talk about the spectrum, it's not the same as being sent to Eton, which at that point, not Eton, um, with the sort of private schools that would have been around, that would have been, you know, 100, 200 times that amount that it would have cost to be educated there. So when I was, as I, I think I said, when I was 14, I changed the way I spoke. And that helped how I moved through the world. Um, but at the same time, I knew people who were really middle class. So this is the spectrum. People whose parents were professors, you know. I don't know what their background was, but they were professors. They lived in nice houses. So some of us live in very nice houses. And they had, they had nice cars, they went on holiday. We didn't go on holiday. Um, so that was my background. And race was very much a part of it. Because if you were a person of color in Britain in the 50s and 60s and 70s, probably even the 80s, before there became a, a sort of strong, stronger black or Asian middle class, which we now have, right? Then you were, see you were seen as some kind of subclass person. You were not seen as equal even to white working class people. So it's really, really, really complicated. So we have things like, um, you know, is it about economics? Is it about education? Is it about profession? Is it about what you were talking about, values? Is it about cultural capital? Is it, what else is there? Um, lifestyle. Lifestyle. Taste. Taste. Are we, are we working class because we grew up in working class households still? even though people will say that we're not because of what we do. Do you see what I mean? So it's, it's I, I don't know what the answer is. Just a, a real issue, particularly all of us probably in this room, those of us in the room who are working class from those backgrounds, it's the transit, the transitory class, you know, which I think John Osborne called the horny-handed sons of toil, meaning, I know, whatever, wanker. But it's the, um, <laughs> but it's a really good image because it, Suddenly you're bringing this idea of factory work or, or, or working the land to the page. Like I talk about being at the coal face of poetry because that's in the heritage. But we are actually in a limbo space between our people and our people. You see what I mean? Mm. And that's... I don't know if you agree with that, but I, I, well, I have the sense that... Just to add to that, I guess one thing we have in common is we don't really have a conversation with our parents, our grandparents, our uncles, aunties about our literature, do we? There, yes. there is no support there. We have to do it ourselves, don't we? Essentially. Yes. Like when you talk about your PhD, I mean, yeah, yeah. who've done this? We don't have that conversation. Sorry. I remember going to. Is this on? Yeah. I remember going to uh, my uh, ex husband's house, very upper middle class family, and we're just having a cup of tea and a piece of cake. And the conversation at the table was the Austrian Fenig in 1930. And I just thought, how can you have that conversation? Because I knew nothing about it at all. They were super well educated, and that was, they would have conversations about modernism. And mm. I, and th this was just casual conversation. They're not showing off. This is how they spoke. This is what they spoke about. We did talk about Coronation Street. And when we do the pub quiz, that's my specialist subject. <laughs> it's Coronation Street. I'm proud of Coronation Street. But lots of people sort of look at me like, oh, God, I wouldn't admit that. I'm happy to admit that. It's just, you know, my little hobby. It's not the Austrian Fennig. I don't know, I couldn't join in. And I think when you grow up in certain households and this is your conversation at the dinner table, at breakfast table, you have that uh, wider understanding of, of art. It's definitely giving you a head start if you then go on to study politics or whatever. You have that cultural capital is what we called it. And I think you can't minimise the advantage that is if you go into a certain profession, not all professions, because I think when you were working class 40 years ago, it's very easy, much easier, I should say, to define 
whether you're working class, because of the professions that were available, like mining, like you know, uh, carpentry, like whatever. Now the working classes are doing um, call centres and other jobs, service industry, working in shops. It's, it's harder to define. It used to be the work that you did with your hands. It's no longer the work you do with your hands, necessarily. So I think there's a massive advantage that middle-class children have if they go into certain areas. They have this sort of confidence. They've had these conversations. I think, I think you know, the, 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 the middle-class story, and of course, again, that's on a spectrum, is one that we don't hear about because often middle-class people don't want to admit that, they, they, that they've had those advantages, right? Yes. But actually, if you think about, we talked, we've talked you know, over this uh, period about literature, if you uh, look at publishing, the facts are, this isn't me making up, the facts are that the majority of people, it's something like 90% of people yes. in publishing identify as middle-class, right? So, and the majority of writers are middle-class, and, okay, how do we define that? But people who, I suppose, come from families where they're both, both parents are professionals, there's money, there's perhaps a little bit of inherited wealth, even though the generation before that might have been poorer and struggling, right? But there is, it's like, it's the default. The mm. middle class, okay, we don't want to homogenize either, right? But, but sort of um, the middle classness of the literature sector is unchallenged yeah. unless you get like Kit, <laughs> you know, um, sort of making this rallying cry around working class writers, or Joel, or Wayne, you know, talk and, and Dalgit with his work talking about it. Everybody thinks that there's it's, there's some kind of level playing field, and that's not the case. Can I ask you guys a question? That one of the things that I was interested in from yeah. everyone that's spoken so far is like this kind of subtext of shame and yeah. the way that like that seems to have played a huge part in each of your kind of narratives i, I i'm not i don't want to be the interviewer here but like but it, I, i'd be really interested for if if any of you wanted to sort of talk a little bit more about how how you've moved in the, you know with that kind of almost shadow of shame following you about all over the shop you, you know? know just to say a lot of people wouldn't admit to being working class years ago. Mm. I mean, that's how much the yeah. conversation has changed. Yeah. But now you can wear it as a badge of honor. But years ago, everybody was pretending to pass, yes. right? Yes. But in terms of, of literature, when we're thinking about class, um, like, are there things that we are allowed, I feel like we're working class people who are open about it, are expected to write about one thing. Yes. So in my career, it's been, I wrote one poem about a tower block about 15, 20 years ago, and my agent is still wanting me to write about it and to kind of, you know, and she's an amazing agent, she's fantastic, but she's like, that's, that's what you know, yes. you know? And I th I've talked to many writers, um, I don't want to name them here because we're being filmed, but um, <laughs> they are being, what they're, the narratives are allowed to own aren't the ones they want to tell. This particular person, wants to be a speculative sci-fi kind of writer, but he's black. And so the publishing houses are like, well, where's the book about the gangs? Yes. Where's, he? yeah, I won't tell too much because you'll know who it is. But, you know, I think that's it. Could, how, how, how can we be working class and, and write about anything we want? Absolutely, I think what, what's... We, we will know that we have, we've made progress when the working class writer can say, I'm going to write about the drawing rooms of 18th century France. And people go, you, because you should, you should be writing about the tower block or the poverty or the, well, gritty crime. Yeah. Somehow you're allowed to write gritty crime if you're a working class writer. They want to see that because surely you know because you've got a brummy accent. So... That's fine, you can do that. What you can't do is the genteel comedy of manners with the crinoline dress. You can't write the new Pride and Prejudice. How would you know that? So that we will know we've made progress when there aren't assumptions made about what we are allowed to write about, what we're expected to write about, how bolshy we are supposed to be and how outspoken, or our terrible stories of struggle and poverty and all of those things. 
that's what people want to read, almost voyeuristic, almost poverty porn, that they want to get in there, oh my God, it was so terrible for you. Well, I don't want to write that. I do want to write sci-fi. I do want to write Pride and Prejudice too. All of those things, we should be allowed to write about those things without assumptions being made about our state of mind, our interests and our expertise. Just, just to say that how much of it... Can we talk about accents? Because you mentioned accents. Yes. So, you know, when it comes to people of colour, that is something that you cannot hide, right? Yeah. That fact that you are a brown person. Um, accent is something you can change. And so yes. you perhaps can make a decision about whether you... Like I said, I did, right? Um, whether you want to change your accent or yes. not. And if you don't then how are you perceived and how does that affect your opportunities as a writer? Because there are three accents here, right? Yes. Daljit, you're kind of a bit more like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so can we talk about that? Yes. You know, um, Wayne is editor of Poetry Review. For those of you who don't know, it is the most prestigious elite poetry uh, journal in the UK, right? And it's over 100 years old. And... There is Wayne with your accent, which is not RP. That's true. I mean, I actually, it's interesting. I, I can't remember the person's name, but there was someone from uh, yesterday that was watching us do our thing yesterday that came up to me and asked me about it. Did someone just say yes? It's such a brilliant question, like, and insightful to just come and ask me about my accent. And um, I actually felt, I. I didn't really understand it all to start with, but I felt like I needed to prove myself in terms of poetics as well. Right? So like the first part, I don't talk, I, I had this first pamphlet that came out loads earlier than everything else that I did. And it is basically just me trying to prove that I can also you, you know, use massive words. And like, and, and I would, I, I, I was affecting an accent at that. And, and when I started like getting into spaces and like being published by you know bigger publishers and and whatever i actually just thought I, i'm not going to do this anymore you know and actually sometimes now because i know how to do it and and when you write in a certain way look, if you're writing academically you have to write in a certain way so that i but i actually correct my gra or uncorrect my grammar so that i so that i speak how i've always spoken although it, it does have more of a london vibe now than a wiltshire vibe because obviously i sounded a lot more like a farmer when i was growing up swindon's um you know a lot more kind of uh rural in that area but um but yeah i, I feel like it's, it's a, uh, for me i've i've reverted back but i wonder though if that's it's easier to do when you've kind of yes. made it. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So it's like actually, it, like I, I got to where it's a bit cowardly in a way, isn't it? To like be like, well, I'll get to where I need to be, and then I'll do the thing. It's like um, when Radiohead like gave away their album for free, and everyone was like, wow, that's amazing. It's like, yeah, but a Radiohead, like a, a starting out band, can't do that. That's I feel a little bit fraudulent for doing it, but I don't really know what to do now. Do you know what I mean? So I, I'm just doing this. <laughs> I think it's really important to be authentic, very, very important to be authentically yourself. And that takes confidence, it's, you know, it's not easy. I've got the accent that is always voted consistently in the UK, the worst accent in the world, in the UK rather. It's very, it's the Brummie accent, it's unattractive, it's got short vowels, it's whiny, it goes up and down. I'm very happy with it, frankly. <laughs> but um, I have to, um, I have to acknowledge that for some people when they hear the accent they're going to think thick um, there's, there's even an advert I think featuring a Brummy person who talks like that all the time because they're perceived as being very thick and yeah. you know useless um, and I'm very happy with it but it definitely I, I have been in places where I have said something and someone's mimicked it back to me so I might have said something like um you know, oh, I didn't know that, that's how I'd say. And they'd go, oh, didn't you know that? And they think that's absolutely fine, absolutely fine to make fun of your accents. If you're not confident, and, and as exactly as Wayne said, if you're new in that sort of environment, someone's doing that, that's going to throw you. It doesn't bother me at all. But it would throw you, and you might think, I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to modulate. I'm going to pass. I'm going to code switch. 
so that I'm not going to suffer at the hands of my accent. But there is nothing more revealing, I think, in, the, in Great Britain than accent. Yeah. It's, you know, the short vowel. So people that are posh, not just posh, but from London as well, would say bath and grass and laugh. I say bath and grass and laugh. And the long vowel is indicative of class. Not, not just class, like I say, but certainly one of the ind indicators of class. Can I just ask you, Kit? You know, you, were, um, you said you would live with the barrister for 25 yes, years. Yes, yes. Did you maintain your Brummy accent? Yes, I wow, did. Wow, I did. I mean, I, what I would say is the accent was the same. The content of the sentence might have been different. And longer words, different sentence structure. I can't change my accent. But definitely there was a difference in the content and what I said in my vocabulary and all of that sort of stuff. The accent, I can't do anything about, but I, don't, I now don't want to. I can remember a time when I, it would have been softer, but it's now just, Jesus Christ, I'm too old now. Just get on with it. Do you want to say anything about add, accent? Add to the accent conversation. Absolutely. So I brought, brought, brought up in the, in the Northwest, the North which back in the sort of 70s and 80s was a very, very long way away from London. And uh, we hate Southerners, all of them. <laughs> Literally, I remember my brother going, lager drinking, keys eating Southern pufters. You know, that was <laughs> basically, we hated them because we thought of them as a separate country. The rich people live there and they abuse us. Um, and our accent, my accent's always been difficult because I moved 13 times and the, it, within, the area I'm from, there are distinct accents in each part. Um, so we, I was always really aware that I was seen as aggressive. I literally was, but with the accent as well, northern women yeah. are seen as much more aggressive, you know, because it's got these flat vowels and you don't fuck about, and you use swearing as kind of breath. Really, it's a way of kind of punctuating each word. Yeah, um, but I've lived in London for 30 years, and so I've got this kind of hybrid accent, like Wayne, that goes from northern to sort of like East End to uh, RP, all over the place. But uh, we're absolutely, it's a real indicator of class in the UK. That's it. Well, just to add, um, I would say my name is my accent and my skin colour. From childhood, people struggle to say my name. If I send emails, I'm really conscious of these two foreign names. Even though Dal Jit, is, I think it's quite simple, people still struggle with that. And they won't say my name because it's really hard. What will they say? So, you know, they'll talk. So one of the things I did when I, became, when I was a teacher, I went to supply teaching to get my writing started. So I go to school to school. And I start using Dal. And then the school, um, schools would call up to the agency and say, can we have Dal? Because um, I was using Dal Jit. I, w I wasn't getting the repeat work, and someone, one of the teachers said, oh, what's your name? It's really hard to say. And so it's words to that effect. And he meant well, so I, I'm not offended by that, at least he's honest. And I just started using Dell, Dell or Dow, whatever people want to use. And I suddenly got loads of work. And wow. um, it's like an accent thing, isn't it? And from my childhood, I guess people used to talk about my skin color has been ugly, you know, or, you know, and that's sort of in a certain environment back in the 70s, you know, you were kind of really aware that you were ugly. So in a sense, that there's a, a type of accent, isn't it? A nuance. Mm. We're talking accent and nuance. Yes. Yeah. There's that. I don't know if you had that, Bernie, with like surname. Yeah, but people never know where that's from. It's ever, yeah, but it's ever not Aristo. local, is it? No, 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 no. It's not no. Smith. But yeah, just name again, because my name is obviously Joel, and I'm from. Uh, you won't know how weird this is. <laughs> it is Joel, Daljit. <laughs> like um, <laughs> where I came from, it's such a strange name. Nobody's called it. Everyone's called Tracy, Sharon. My parents were having a laugh, and they named me Joel. Jehovah is God, the chosen one. That's what it means. <laughs> I know. But it meant all through my childhood, my name was a question. What's your name? Joel. Joel! Like that. And it just went on and on and on. Now it's actually quite a common name, so it's fine. But that was another sort of distinction. Having a name that makes you look like you're pretentious. Yes. My mum even said, you've got problems because we named you that. That's why you're depressed, because you, <laughs> we've raised your expectations of life with your name. Should have called you Beverly. No offence, <laughs> <laughs>
Um, shall we just, before we open it up to the audience, talk about um, class and race? Simply because, you know, there is this kind of, we've touched on it briefly in the session sometimes, this um, understanding that working class in Britain means white. Mm -hmm. And yes. that doesn't mean the other people who are working class. Mm. So do you want to kick off, um, Wayne? Mm. It's really difficult to, to kind of be, like I don't, I, I, I tend to, when we get into this area of the conversation, like I've, I, I just really want to listen because I, I have a lot to learn still. Like I have embedded, you know, like I, there, was, there were two guys that lived down the road from me who, uh, whose dad ran the local corner shop. They were called Sanjay and VJ, and I wasn't allowed to play with them. Like, and my, my mum would be like, I'm not racist. But I don't want you playing with those kids. Do you know what I mean? It'd be like, hold on, I'm eight, but it does feel racist. It does, you know, like maybe I've understood the term, but like, um, but I did it sort of anyway. And um, and my mum kind of gradually grew to accept that the 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 these people were just all right. You know what I mean? And 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 it it seems like bizarre to have to say stuff like that. Like, and especially, and, and there's, it's still kind of that, there's still, I think, particularly, uh, the really interesting thing, actually, Bernie, is like, I have a, I have a kid who's um, gender non-binary, sweary little rascal, but sometimes I still say, like, um, sometimes there's, a, there's someone that was, she was talking about someone, I was like, oh, is that, is that the black guy? And she's like, why oh, you got to say that? Do you know? Why did you have to say, like, yeah, but that's not, that's not the point. And I was like, yeah, you're actually right. Like, I've had, you know, it's like, that's not even what I would understand as racist, but even the way that I'm kind of needing to sort of um, understand people within the context of that category is now like the next generation are calling me out and it's so important. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it, but it's also important, I realise, not to get defensive about it, but for me to say, no, you're right. Do you know what I mean? And actually just listen. And these guys don't even, you know, I remember... Um, they were talking about one, one kid once in their class, and I was like, um, there was from, uh, where were they from? Their, their parents were like uh, Japanese, or maybe Japanese. And like, I was like, what, who are you talking about? And they were like, oh, well, they got black hair, and they're about this tall. And they, they didn't mention like color or ethnicity at all. And I was like, this is what, that wasn't, that wasn't tall, and it wasn't performative. That's just how like Finn navigates the world, you know what I mean? And the communities that they're part of. And, and that's something that I've really still got to learn from that, you know? That's basically my position on it. I, I sort of like, when people talk, people love, like in my, when my, my work thing, everyone always wants to talk to me about class and masculinity. I mean, not masculinity, not the stereotypical masculinity is, it's not exactly me, is it? But like, they love to talk about that stuff because I'm like an inheritor of like, the, the, you know, the angry white men kind of thing. And that's how, in this country, working class people are still kind of defined, isn't it? Which is why it's really important to, to shut up a lot of the time, which is what I'm going to do now. <laughs> Anyone else? Hit. Um, I, I know that when I first... So I've only been a, a published writer since 2016. And I know that when I first became a published writer, there was a lot of... Uh, be, just because of what I was talking about, about class, I did have black writers saying to me, why aren't you talking about race? Because I was talking about class all the time. And what I would always say is this, the intersection between race and class is so strong, so strong, that in talking about class, for me, inevitably, you're talking about race. Because so much of the UK's black population is working class is living in substandard housing, have poor schools, have jobs that don't pay enough. And that then translates into who gets time to write. For me, that was the thing. Who gets time to write? Who can afford to go to the class? Who's got the energy to go to the writing class? Who's got the laptop that week out of the whole family? All of those things. And that's what I was interested in really in, is, is class as it relates to publishing, which inevitably, for me, impacted on black people, and I was thinking, let's cure class 
and in curing class, obviously we have not cured it, but let's talk about it, and in talk about it, we will inevitably draw in so many of the things that affect the black population. So I, I sort of made it my crusade, if you like. That's what I was gonna talk about. Not to exclude class, but to bring it in under the umbrella of class and all of the things that affect us as working class people absolutely affect us as black people plus racism. So it's class plus race. And just to say before I throw it open actually, that there are some initiatives as well as um, kit scholarship around class and literature. So there is the Writers and Artists Working Class Writers Prize, I yes. think it's called, yes. which I think has just been set up. There is Blue Moose Books, and they publish working class writers. I don't know how long they've been going. And there's also the Working Class Writers Festival, yes. which I think Damien Barr set up. Yes. Did he? Yes. So, so there are these, you know. Lots of other things. And other things. Yeah, yeah. there's also um, a bursary that Louise Doughty set up at UEA for a working class writer. There is Working Class Academics Network. And that's for not just for writers, but for working class academics who want support. That's that they have a conference every year. There are lots and lots of people doing lots of things now. I mean, before as well, you know, for, for a long time. But now it's just come much more into the fore. Loads of people are doing good things. And, you know, without these initiatives, um, the, the, the issue remains unexamined and everything, the status quo remains the same which is why you have to have these initiatives to not only to develop, say, for example, working class writers, but also to draw attention to the inequality that's yes. prevalent. Otherwise, nothing happens. Because the people who are already in the establishment who are from more middle class backgrounds, they're not gonna change anything. They're not even gonna think there's an issue yeah. because they are the majority. And, and we know that, and, and it's very sort of uh, often spoken about thing that you can't, if you can't, See, you can't beat. So the visibility of black writers coming through has been so important so that other people can think, oh, Bernadine's done it, I can do it. Someone, you know, black writer's done it, I can do it. It's exactly the same for class. As long as we keep our accents and we talk about these things and we're proud to be who we are, then someone will go, do you know what, they can do it with that Cockney accent, I can do it. They can talk about... Um, whatever they want to talk about being working class. So I can do about, I can write about it, or I can write the Pride and Prejudice novel because someone else has gone before and said, I'm here and, and opened the door for other people to come through. Can I just, can I just add, just uh, the Asian angle, I guess, Indian, Pakistan, Bangladesh, but it's probably a bit like the Asian footballer. There aren't Asian footballers who play in Britain. And that, that hasn't really happened with the writers yet as well. Um, I, I think that kind of migrant psychology is so peculiar and I think in my sort of background, various people I know from the Asian community, there seems to be this kind of aspiration to make money in my background, get out there, make money. The cultural stuff, um, our, our families, you know, the laborers that came over in the 60s, 70s, 80s, they're not confident about going to cult, uh, cinemas or theater, you know, West, they go to Bollywood and whatever, but they wouldn't go to theaters to watch arts events. So we haven't, still haven't had that transference yet. So I don't, that's a whole issue in itself, isn't it? We haven't really dealt mm -hmm. with that those sort of working class Asian authors, where are they going to come through? Um, we have the kind of Qureshis and Rushdies who come from the elite backgrounds, but yes. that transference still, I see hardly any uh, working class people like of my background coming through. It's just not happening yet. So it might be this whole generation when people like me become, you know, the professors, my children get educated in turn, they might become authors. Mm. I mean, that relationship between the, say, for example, Asian writers who do well and class and education is something that's also unexamined, isn't it? Mm. Definitely. Okay, so I'd um, like uh, to throw it open to the audience uh, if anybody's got a question or also would like to make a contribution or an observation. Perhaps if we can have the lights up on the audience. There's somebody down here at the front. Maybe you should. Is there a microphone or you just want to shout? Hello, thank you so much again, um, Bernadine, for doing such an amazing and inspiring seminar and everyone taking part. I've really, really enjoyed it. 
Um, one of the commonalities I saw here is education. Um, and my question is, knowing or unknowing some of the obstacles and challenges that Joel and also Kit have mentioned, why, when did you decide to pursue an education? Why did you and how did that impact your writing? I mean, if I can just jump yes, in here. Yeah. So the only way out of the ends is to be in a pop, pop, is to be in a band, be a footballer or education. And I was just very lucky because of the background that I, I, fell, in, I fell into books. I loved to read, absolutely loved to read. Because of that, I read about universities. Like, they're not part of my background at all. There's no expectation for me to get um, GCSEs. My parents did, um, my grandparents didn't, left school at like 13, 14. So, um, it was really falling in love with the idea of education through books and it being a sense of freedom and escape. But then the second I walked through those university gates, um, it was quite a shock. A, I wasn't the clever kid anymore. Everybody knew everything more than me. I didn't even understand what the lecturers are saying. They were using words like, the first word was trope. And I put my hand up in a whole lecture, so, 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 so what's a trope? And he said, it's a figure of speech. And I wrote down, it's a figure of speech. And then felt really humiliated for the rest of the session. And it just went on like that, you know? Mm -hmm. You have a really good rehearsal. Everybody gets up and goes to have a meal or goes to the pub and you're just like, oh, I feel really tired, actually. You know, um, so there's a, a sense of separation. But I, for me, education is freedom, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's not just fiction. Yes. Um, so I could not wait to leave school. I hated it. I left school. I was actually 15 when I left school. Um, never intended ever, ever to go to university. The only time university was mentioned in my house was University Challenge was on with Bamba Gascoigne. That was the only way you'd ever mention that word. Nobody went to university in my family. I went to university at 51 to do an MA in creative writing uh, for a year. And... Um, I wouldn't have gone, but I, I knew I just had to learn the craft. So education for me was, obviously I was being educated through novels, through reading, through rereading, uh, watching films, talking about books. That's an education, it's not a formal education. Um, so I have got seven O levels from school and an A level, which I did early, but they're nothing formal till an MA in creative writing. And it most definitely is a route, I, I wouldn't call it a route out of being working class, because I don't think I, I want to, and loads of people don't want to leave being working class, but it is a route to a wider world, however you experience that. And the beauty of ideas, and the beauty of class, and art, and literature, and what an education gives you is a way to articulate how you feel. Instead of saying, I don't like that book, you can say, I didn't think this worked. I didn't think the characterizations would work. It just gives you a vocabulary to talk about your life and to talk about your ideas. That's what an education gives you. Great, thank you. Another question, lady over here. Thanks very much. Um, now, you're all clearly phenomenal poets and writers. Um, do you suffer from imposter syndrome? And if yes, how do you deal with that? Any advice? I don't. Good. Sorry. I don't. No. I, I feel don't. very entitled, but Me it's taken too. a long time to feel very entitled. Do you yeah. know, winning a major prize absolutely makes you feel like you belong in the room. Yeah. You know, but a part of that, again, that's what you the aggression as well. I think I feel deep down quite a bit of resentment, you know. Um, but no, I, I, I've earned this space, this room. I did have it. I did have it a lot. How about you? Uh, I'm going to sound quite cruel, but if you suffer from imposter syndrome, it's because you probably are an imposter. <laughs> That's cruel, isn't it? But I thought it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> no one laughed. Thank you. <laughs> no, I, I think if you, if you... Yeah, anyway, I'm going to stop. <laughs> I'm going to pass on the way. Oh, I don't, Come I don't, on, the old imposter, the, tell us. <laughs> this is the... Uh, we had the nice pictures outside earlier, of us all smiling and that, and now 
this, they had to do that because of the, the huge disagreement that me and Dal Jr. was going to have. No, I, don't, I, I actually <coughs> massively, massively still suffer from imposter syndrome. Like, hugely. I, I did, like, yesterday, I had this brilliant workshop, and there was um, <coughs> a, a, a girl in the workshop um, was reading, read a poem out that, you know, so that I didn't have to do all that. And, and, and you could see the paper shaking, right? And she was like, sorry, like, I thought I was going to be all right, but I... And I was like, you know, the thing is, like, when we were over here, I was like, the thing about me is now, I just get to hide behind the lectern, right? But yesterday, unhelpfully, someone had stuck that rose or whatever it is on the end. So, like, you could see the rose shake. You couldn't see me shaking, but I was shaking, and I was making that rose thing shake. And I think the, the, in every single sphere that I'm, mean, like, lecturing, like... Um, the, there's always a cleverer student. Do you know what I mean? There's a student that's clever, like, um, like reading poems or going to a particular event, editing poetry review. Like, I definitely, definitely feel like an imposter there. And just to pick up on what Dal just said, obviously we all went, oh my God. But <laughs> actually, he's completely right because these spaces are not set up for us and so we impose ourselves upon them. And then we yes. own it, so perhaps the word imposter it's a positive thing. I am a fucking imposter. I'm yes. an invader. I'm having it. Yes. <laughs> Great. So somebody at the back had their hand up. Yes. So the person there with the blue top. Oh. Hi. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for talking about these barriers to actually being published because I've been to a lot of like um, author talks as a student and I feel like Sometimes I feel like the message is kind of, if you work really hard, you can, and you read all the classics and you read the right things, you too can be just like me. Um, and so thinking about these barriers to being published, um, my question is, do you think your writing process changed um, from like before you were quote unquote like a real author and like whatever that means, like being published and after you kind of first published work. Um, it gives a sense of, so winning something gives you more of a sense of authority. And um, so it, mean, it meant that I start, I, I, um, I focused, probably for the first time, age 55, I actually sat down and thought, oh, okay. So my pros, oh, I get more time. As working class people and as many parents we talked about in the room, like your writing process is affected by your actual living experience. Mm -hmm. So not everybody can afford to sit down, you know, and coughing into silk handkerchiefs and, and spending all day working on six fabulous lines that will last forever, you know. Um, but if you, if you get some kind of a prize which came with money, which buys time and space, then it does affect your writing process because you can go, I am taking a month and all I'm going to do is work on this book. It's my experience. Yeah. Uh, just, just to say, Wayne, you know... Um, you won the National Poetry Prize, didn't you? Yeah. And there are about, how many poems are submitted for that? 13,000 or something? 16,000. 16,000 poems. And, and you won it a few years wow. ago. Yeah. Can you I just quickly say what about it? What's that? National Poetry Prize. No, the posh mums are boxing in the square. Yeah. Can, can I just finish though, Wayne? I think you, you, have, to, you have to change your mindset. Yeah. You know, because change your mindset. Yeah. Okay, you're a great writer anyway, whether you won that prize or not. But you are occupying, in many ways, a really establishment positions at the moment. Yeah. So you need to change your mindset and stop saying that you feel like an imposter. Yeah. Say that you are entitled. And yeah. if you say it often enough, you will become entitled. Yeah. 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 I feel like this has kind of become like, um, it's kind of become some kind of self-help session for me. Like, <laughs> if all, if I did, that was a pretty dif difficult turn. In the, in the impact. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I th that's true. I think the thing is about imposter, it, it has a connotation that it's not deserved. You're an imposter because you don't deserve to be here. So with all the hard work we do as writers and the hard, things we have to overcome as working class writers, we absolutely, published or not, deserve to be a writer, deserve to call ourselves a writer. You particularly... I oh, know it's a self-help session for you, Wayne. But, you know, you deserve to be here. Impo imposters don't deserve or shouldn't. And people that deserve to be there are not imposters. And I think it's to do with what we deserve and the worth we're putting on ourselves 
as writers, as well as society. But if, you, if you're doing the work, you deserve to be there. And also, well, if we're not doing the work, who's going to be doing it? Yes. Is that what we represent oh, as well? Because the other thing is, if we don't tell our stories as working class people, believe me, someone else will tell that story and they won't get it right and it'll be a middle class person saying, this is what it's like to be working class. And until we have the confidence to say, no, this is what it's like, I'm going to tell it from, from where it comes from rather than have it reinterpreted through a middle class lens. If we don't do it, someone else will stand in and do it for us. Lovely. So I just want to take one more question. Did you have your hand up? Yes, lady over there. Thank you so much for the last couple of days. Um, it's lovely to experience your generous creativity. Um, my question, it might be a bit windy because there's a lot of thoughts coming up, but it has to do with um, there's this intersection of race and class that then renders you as like quite a code switcher and traveling between dimensions. And in your writing processes, particularly like Kit and Bernadine, I'm interested in that because there's also like a, a gender thing as well there. Um, in your writing process and in, in that um, developing of multiple voices and characters, you kind of have to embody things that you might have witnessed growing up or things that you might have experienced growing up. Um, and I wonder what that process is of stepping into a character and then stepping out of a character or like how those voices develop and what that process is of pot like potentially like re-triggering yourself. Uh, like does that happen at all or is there like a distance? Do you have to have like an intellectual distance from the character to be able to, because that's, yeah, that's quite a tricky thing. I mean, I think we could all answer that actually. You know, I don't really, uh, my work, 97% of my work is not autobiographical. Um, but as a writer, I know we, we actually saw Joelle get really emotional herself through reading her work, you know, remembering her work um, yesterday. So actually, as a writer, you have to, I think, or many of us feel that we want to inhabit the characters and go there emotionally wherever it is that we have to take them. And that's something that you take on. And I think you can be a very cerebral writer. You know, there are fiction writers who are very cerebral and they don't really affect you emotionally. But I would say that all of us are actually kind of very, you know, we, are, we, are, we have a really strong emotionality with our work and that involves at some level going there into those experiences ourselves, even if it's not our own experiences. We're gonna, this has to be the last question, so... Um. Um, I was just going to say, and, and also, all of us have multiple identities. I mean, it's, it, it looks extreme when it's black and white in one person, but all of us have multiple identities as father, son, daughter, stamp collector, tennis fan, whatever, we've got all... But it's, it depends on what you're writing. You know, like a diamond, you've got these different facets, and it depends on where the light hits it. I'm going to be that, I'm going to be that, I'm going to talk about that. And all of them you know, they're all beautiful, but it just depends on where you're gonna shine a light, which bit you're gonna talk about today. Great, I think we're gonna finish now. Oh, um, Elka said we have to finish. Oh, you had a question. I thought you were trying to wind me up. Okay, wind up the event. Okay, so there are two questions then, sorry. It is a question to you all as readers. Um, in the Victorian literature, uh, there is one uh, literary character which is dominant uh, as an aspiring character to change class, and that is the governess. Um, it's a very strong uh, literary figure. Is, is there something like that, some figure uh, in contemporary UK writing which uh, takes up this position? Are you talking about in a particular work or a recurring... I mean, in Victorian novels, the governance was very present and always the emblem of somebody tr uh, aspiring to change class. Did you say the governance? The governess. governess. The governess. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry the governess. Sorry. Yes. Um, it, I mean, yeah. uh, plenty of, uh, yeah, plenty of novels. Um, uh, so is, is there some figure um, which you would think in contemporary UK writing which has taken up that position? Ooh, anybody, anybody know? I can't. I can't really think of a figure like that, like no. reoccurring figure in contemporary literature. But I think it's the. It, it's almost like the um, 
Pip character in Great Expectations, who goes from what you'd say working class in goes to the equivalent of Oxford and becomes, you know, turns his back on his roots. And I think in contemporary literature, that's what would be demonstrated by social mobility, you know, by anyone who leaves their hometown, perhaps goes to London, goes into the art scene or whatever, changes their accent. But I can't think of a character in a novel that does that. Um, ah. No, yeah, as a person, there's probably loads of people who've done it as a person, but I don't think in literature I can think of... But it's the rags to riches story, isn't it? It it's is. It is Rags to Riches. Jeffrey Archer. But it, <laughs> wasn't it called Rags to Riches? But yes, um, yes. I think there was, maybe there's just too wide too. a range of novels out there for, it to be, for you, you to be able to detect recurring themes in that way. Yes. Perhaps, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yes, lady here. Um, fabulous pupil, thank you so much. Uh, but also, like, um, I just want to talk about the way that you had your desires, you know, just like talking about your desires and how you have them while being working class and to cultivate them, you had to go out of that space. Going, if it's just like claiming a body, going for education, publication, becoming a poet and, 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 and all that. And then um, uh, basically going after it, fulfilling it required you to leave that very community. And then why, why it's tasting that desire, you know, once you have it. You had the palate of, you know, the working class, if you, if you would say that. Uh, and this transition somehow reminds me of migration. Because of, and um, you now arrive in this middle class zone. Would you consider yourself as first generations of middle class, the same way we classify different generations of migrants? Uh, your thoughts on that? I would love to hear that. Thank you. Well, I, I, what is interesting is that I don't think any of us live where we grew up. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So we have all literally left our home, our home territory. Um, but I'll let, I'll let the others answer this. Can I say one, one really quick thing? Is I, don't, I don't know about that. That's such an insightful question, right? But like, what I do know is my kid is middle class. Like, mm, for definite. Yes. You know? Yeah. Like, I, I mean... So I have them half the time, the mum has them half the time. Their stepdad um, is like the head of production for Anish Kapoor, who's like this, yeah. So he, you know, he's in all right. And then like, and then the, all of the conversations that we have, like give them access to the areas that, um, that I never had access to. So even my kid would be like, yeah, I'm, I'm middle class. You're probably working class, but I'm middle class. And, um, and they kind of understand that dynamic straight away. And I think that's, that's quite an interesting thing, isn't it? It's like, well, um, what do I do or how do I <coughs> kind of sit with that? And there's nothing I can do. I just think you've got to let them do their own thing and be their own person and enjoy the things that they like. And if it gives them ac immediate access to areas that they want, they want to be a photographer. So, like, I mean, good. I know some photographers now that I can put them in touch mm -hmm. with. But I don't know, that's such an interesting question about the are we first generation middle class? I don't know. It's still a struggle, isn't it? Like, we are pioneers, though. I, I always felt like we are one. We pioneers, yeah. yeah. And I, I, maybe it's an aside, but I, I still think that, you know, writing gives me such emotional wealth that I, when I enter writing, I do it with humility. I'm serving the poem, and if I win any prizes, it's a lovely vanity, but the highs and lows are all imposters, and it's, it's about keeping your well-being and enjoying the writing. So I try and keep it as fresh as when I first wrote it. So I'm not going to be swayed by any prizes or if a poem fails. I think, well, that was my best. It wasn't good enough. Uh, there's that aspect of the yeah. writing process. The Zen level is what I'm offering everyone here. <laughs> and if you want to go for tofu sandwich afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say the same, actually. My children are absolutely middle class. One has got ponies, for fuck's sake. And the other one it restores classic cars, very expensive classic cars. And they make fun of me, so they, act, they, they mimic me really well. You know, like, duh, 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 duh. They, take, they take the mickey out of me. They're very middle class, and I think very much like my father who came from the West Indies to England and uh, saw himself as a West Indian, 
we didn't see ourselves as a West Indian. We saw ourselves as British. So uh, very much moved away from his identity to our own identity. And my children have moved from my identity into their own identity, which is definitely middle class middle-class desires. They can have a conversation about the Austrian Fennig if they want to. They'd feel very comfortable having those conversations. They've got enormous cultural capital. Um, and there is that difference between us. But it's one of the things about educating your children and perhaps having a, a nicer lifestyle than my parents. It's inevitably going to, in some ways, erode the things. I can't make them working-class children. I don't know if I'd want to. You know, does it work the other way? Yes. Can you grow up middle class and, and become then working become class. working class? Don't think so. I don't, no, man. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. know. Instinctively, I just was like, no. But then you but could, then you could. You could, if you, because if you, you had marry a mid, into a yeah. so next generation or could. Or if you're a middle class person, uh, and let's say you lost your money, you move to a council estate, have children, your children, you've got the posh accent and all the rest of it, but your children are located themselves in that society, yes. Just to add but, to But this. you can't, your children But you've still got your yeah. education. Yeah. You've still got your education. I, I am, so I, I just, I'm from a mining family, very poor, blah, blah, blah. Um, and my mother died and I just found a CD of photographs of my ancestors on my mother's side, and they're wearing Edwardian, very posh dresses, perambulating in a park. So I'm clearly the result of, say, third generation from a middle class yes. southern family. They're from the south of England as yes. well. So, yeah, Maybe the possible. fall is slower. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. OK, any more questions? Yes, uh, person here, the black top. No, no, I think, no, I think, I think you need the mic. Um, yeah, you've already kind of been tackling um, my next question there. I do kind of feel a bit stupid asking this, but having a mother that is working class and a father that is more middle class and always being somewhere in the middle, um, and also you talked about your children, which are now middle class and you've been working class. My big question is that I had in my head during your conversation, and thank you so much for sharing your experience, um, I just need to say that, is um, living in a middle class dominated work, uh, wor uh, uh, world, how would you make, how would you, how can you support working class people? How can you make their life easier? How can you reduce the shame and give comfort? And how can you make just people feel belong? Who wants world? to take that? <laughs> Solutions. I, th I think being visible, being visible is a major one. You don't have to do anything but be there so that people can see you and talk about it. If you want to talk about it, and you, I don't think we should make people talk about it if they don't want to, but just be there. And if you get any kind of power and opportunity, just saying, you know, do you want to come with me to a working class person? Do you want to come with me? You don't have to do anything, but just give people exposure. Just make it, make that road a bit slippier for other people. Just make it slightly easier so that more people can be in those spaces. Not, we don't want, everything to be working class but just have enough people in that space so that other people can go forward that's what i would do i i have a question for the german people in the audience can you can somebody tell us something about how class works in germany <laughs> yep okay lady here straight up <laughs> sorry i've been waiting for this question <laughs> And I just grabbed the mic and too bad for everyone else. But um, it's been fascinating to listen to this. And thank you, Bernadine, for asking, because in some ways, some of what of distinctions, differences, and whatever. But the class discussion does not run along those lines mm. that you've been discussing. Starting with accent, for example. <laughs> in Germany, local accents have always been much more marked. So you can have a local accent and not necessarily thought to be stupid. 
um, it's even quite useful if you are German Chancellor to have mm. a local accent. And yes, Helmut Kohl was considered to be stupid, but not because of his accent, <laughs> because of some of the other things he said. Um, but um, so it wouldn't do you, your career harm to be identifiably from certain areas. Mm. And then, oh yeah, and then, then there is, there are certain areas that are better than others, but yeah, that's a different thing. Um, and the other thing is, Germany as a post-war society has been turned upside down in so many fundamental ways that class wasn't the, you know, the, the, the fundamental problem in many ways because so many people started from scratch being refugees, being, you know, half your family was dead anyway or whatnot. And the, the um, 68 revolution in Germany very much, oh, was about class, of course, and uh, upsetting the bourgeois and everything, but it was also getting rid of the Nazis who were mm. still part of the system. Now, that's just a different issue, and that's been so, those are the, the, the conflict lines that mattered a lot. Whereas, am I working class, am I middle class, am I, I mean, the word upper class is completely ridiculous in German. Oberklasse? What the hell is that? Um, we, we just, well, we don't have a king, a queen or whatever. Um, so, um, whereas we do have a fascinating bit, and I can see lots of people disagreeing, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but um, we have the so-called Kleinbürger, the petty bourgeois, but that doesn't even begin to cover it. And a lot of what you've been talking about as working class would be um, exemplary for Kleinbürger in Germany. Um, whereas the working class have, in many ways, uh, been almost the desirable thing. If you had a working class acquaintance, it was like, yeah! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is going to kick off. Great. <laughs> uh, okay. 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 Can we just hear somebody else who might be disagreeing with you so we get a fuller picture? The guy at the front. With the yeah. Pink. Um, oh. I would like ju just to. to who is I would just like. Talking? I'm in the oh. first row here. I would just like to add something to that. I don't really know because I'm from Austria. But what I would like to connect to is that being rich from heritage is very much connected to national socialism in our society. So being upper class, also I'm talking about Austria now, but being a rich person inheriting things from more than one, two generations means that you haven't been thrown out, put in a concentration camp, being de like, I, I, I have a little bit, not my English is not the best, but it's really like, it's a, the class question is very much connected with the, in the German and Austrian history with what happened, what we did, and with the, yeah, with the, so that's like one part that is not really, but I still would like to say that I can very much connect to everything you said, because it doesn't have to be the same system. We all, and I really liked when Wayne brought up with the shame again, because that is the thing that I connect since day, minute one from this workshop, is that I connect with that and I resonate from that. and. This is something that is emitting into the room, and it's a fuel that we can use. It's a rocket fuel to n other classes, and yeah. Okay, so we just take two more because we, we should uh, sort of wind up now. So um, well, one of the uh, ladies at the back there, and then the guy in the green shirt at the front. Um, thank you. I want to add two things to that. I can't really talk about the generational differences because I'm way too young for that. But um, two things, I think education means a little bit less in Germany when it comes to class because education is much cheaper for us. Yes. Like it is quite yeah. normal to get like a higher education yeah. thing. We pay like not even 300 euros per semester. Mm. 
which is half oh, a year. Wow. That is, and like when people talk about the British education system, I like Absolutely. I would Absolutely. not have go been on. able to go to university in Brit in England because like I can't pay thousands of euros, but for us it's way cheaper. So for us it's much easier to get like to do your A levels and to go on to university. But that also means if you do go to university, that doesn't mean that you get a good job necessarily. Right. Oh. And the second thing also is language, because the thing is with your accent, it does depend where you come from. When you're from Bavaria, no one looks down on you because you have a Bavarian accent. But I'm from like southwestern Germany, from Saarland, that's the smallest of the um, Bundesland states. Thank you. Um, and like for us, education was always high German. It was always like, looked down upon if you spoke your, lo like, lo your local dialect from like primary school on, we had to talk to speak high German. And I, I go to university and I want to stay in, in academia. I could never speak my local accent because people would not take me seriously. Thank you. So just um, this gentleman here, who I think might have asked the first question at the, at the very beginning of the seminar. Thank you very much, all of you, um, for this great event. Um, I mean, I cannot speak for, like, I think my, my, my personal opinion is that we aren't talking that much about class in Germany in comparison to France and England. And I can say that because I'm working on that right now. I'm about to finish my MA in English literature, so I'm really involved in the academic discussion for that. But if you would ask me what cl class means for me, I would like to give you an anecdote. So I'm first-gen academic from a very poor working-class family in the northern part of Germany. And I moved with, uh, like, seven years ago to Berlin, started my degree at a very prestigious uni in Germany. And I had the chance to go to other elite universities with scholarships, the Sorbonne in Paris, and later also King's College in London. So and my sister, she's lesbian, and she is intellectually disabled. And she's working for 1,000 Euro, 1,300 euros per month uh, at McDonald's, you know. So while I was sitting in Paris in a beautiful park in the Tuileries, and I was studying Charles Baudelaire, she was like working full time, 40 hours per week, to get like this a bit of money. While I was sitting there writing essays at the Sorbonne, yeah. and now. I would like to give you another experience now that I'm about to finish my degree. I, I'm just about to realize that I won't earn that much money, you know? I'm going to start to work as an assistant in a cultural job, and I will earn probably 1,500 euros a month. My sister, she didn't study. I studied for seven years, you know? So I'm almost earning the same like her, you know? So that's the question of social mobility. That's also a perspective on that. I can't define class, but there are yeah, many perspectives. Just to, just to say, though, that you will, sorry. You, will have, you will have the opportunity to earn more as your career progresses, though, won't you? Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. That's very the enough. difference. That's true. That's Thank you. Enough. Thank you. Thank you for your contributions. Really fascinating. Um, I think we're going to um, close, close the seminar now. Um, I think Paul is going to say something. Thank you all, and I, I, I'm thrilled that in our last few moments we turned back into Germany, and maybe the 36th British Council seminar should on be should be on class and contemporary German writing. Who knows? But that was the 35th. Um, uh, British Council Germany Literature Seminar. Quite extraordinary to think that this has been happening 35 times over all these years, and what an absolutely wonderful seminar it was. I have been uplifted myself. I've learned more about my own country, I think, in the last two days than I have done for many, many, many times. And uh, we've had an extraordinary range, haven't we, over so many, with so many voices, mostly from these wonderful colleagues and accents and stories and emotions. And we've really ranged over that most important word in terms of identity and definition, the diversities of the, 
societies and situations, certainly in the UK today. And this, this subject of class, which some of us have thought, you know, we spoke about class, didn't we, in the decades gone by. It's not still relevant. It's, my God, how relevant it is. And it, it draws together every possible other kind of diversity. We've been in gender. We've been in sexuality. We've been in race. We've been in ethnicity. We've been in religion. We've been in age. We've been in ability. We've been in disability. Um, so it has been extraordinary. Uh, and for me, it has highlighted my favorite phrase about diversity, which is the title of a book by an ex-chief rabbi of England, and it's called The Dignity of Difference. The Dignity of Difference. And this is what this last two days has been about for me. So some thank yous. First of all, it's always polite to thank the audience, but I really want to thank the audience this time. Both, both you lot and the hundreds who've been online at different points through, through this. Extraordinary, energetic, excited, involved. I'm sure always, I mean, interested in the UK. Many of you are academics and publishers and whatever who, who deal with the UK every day. But I, I know, even if it was only to find out how different it is, I hope also so informed about making you think about your own societies here in Germany and, uh, and elsewhere. Extraordinary audience, particular thanks to those of you who are new to British Council Literature Seminar and particular thanks to those of you who have been around a long time. I met, is it Elfie uh, today, who was at the 1986 first British Council Literature <laughs> Seminar event. <laughs> uh, thanks then to um, the wonderful team at Ayun, this wonderful uh, venue which enshrines so many of the values that we've been talking about over the last few days. So to, uh, to, so to Luna, Lara, and all the team at Oyun, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, d I, I don't always thank at smaller events our own British Council team, but for the literature seminar I do because, my God, they work hard. So my thanks to my colleagues from the British Council uh, Literature Department in the UK, and particular thanks to of my own team here in Berlin, to, uh, to Ruth Groth, to, to, to Lucy Curzon, and she always says, do not mention me, so Dr. Elka Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> And then our wonderful writers. Uh, extraordinary, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Wayne, Daljit, Joel, Kit, yes, thank you, thank you. And no one would deny the most special thanks go to Bernadine. Bernadine, you're you're internationally more in demand than I should think any other writer, certainly from the UK at the moment, so that you gave three days to us here in Berlin. We are enormously indebted and we are enormously grateful. Um, uh, when we, the way the British Council Literature Seminar works is that we, the British Council, try and identify the right person to chair it. And when we've done that, we hand it over to them. They don't just chair it, they curate it. They choose the topic, the themes, they identify the people they want to participate and they go in search of them uh, and they then devise the program. So it actually takes a lot of work but it also means that it really is stamped with the identity and the passions and the values of the chair curator and that's certainly been the case with Bernadine. So Bernadine, thank you very, very much. So thank you all, and that's a wrap, thank you. <laughs>